If you're watching this video, chances are that you're already very aware that Apple finally announced the long-rumored and very much anticipated new MacBook Pros with not the M1 chip, but the M1 Pro and M1 Max chips, which was somewhat surprising. I don't think people were really expecting two chips, at least not until very late in the rumor game. But anyway, naturally YouTube is full to bursting with videos of people discussing these new high-end laptops and I'm just gonna squeeze in here with my own two cents because you definitely need that. <laughs> I don't know about you guys but this announcement feels a bit different to normal Apple announcements because it feels like they did everything right just about. There's very little to criticize here whereas I feel like you know for years we've been asking Apple for things like an SD card slot and this year pretty much everything that everyone's wanted for the past you know five six years Apple's just given it all to us in one go which is nice for a change frankly keep it up Apple well done this kind of feels like the whole coca-cola thing where it's like we're gonna change the flavor and everyone hates it and just when everyone's like getting to the point of giving up they kind of swoop back in they're like hey Guess what? Here's the classics. You're welcome. We're gonna charge more for it now. Like the way that they announced that they were bringing back the ports. All without a single adapter. This is the most advanced connectivity. <laughs> they say it so smugly. It's like, you did this. You, you made dongle life a thing. I feel like they always do things a bit late and then act like it's groundbreaking, but to be fair, when they do things, they generally do them well. Generally. But yeah, it's like they actually listened to everything that people wanted from the next iteration of MacBook and the things they didn't want, touch bar, and then actually did them. So in today's video, I'm going to go over some of the most exciting aspects of these new MacBook Pros, as well as some of the not so exciting aspects. And we're also going to look at the massive power brick, the 140 watt power brick that comes with the 16 inch MacBook Pros. So let's start things off with the very divisive, the notorious notch. Now I know a lot of people hate the notch. I've seen some comments online which are like, whoa, okay. A lot of people are really mad at the whole notch situation. But to be honest, I think it makes a lot of sense. Just think about it for a second before you fly off into a Twitter rage. Don't hate it immediately just because it's a notch. If we look at my current M1 MacBook Pro, for example, this top bezel is big. Not surprising, it is very tall. And even the top bezel on last, well, 2019's 16 inch MacBook Pro was bigger than what it needed to be, right? If the reason for having the entire top bezel is just to house the camera, then this on either side is entirely wasted space. And if the whole reason they can't get the really thin bezels like they got on the sides on the top is because of the camera, why sacrifice all that space just for the sake of the camera? Now, am I 100% happy with the design? Am I 100% happy with just how big the notch is? No, but I'll get to that in a second. Don't think of this as the notch intruding into your screen space, as I've seen many people online describe it. Think of it instead as gaining all the space around. We're moving the screen up and around the camera. We're not moving the camera down into the screen space. You're not losing screen space. We are reclaiming otherwise very useless space and repurposing it to something a lot more useful. While we're in full screen mode and the top bar is hidden, so it's up here, let's imagine it's up in the top bezel because that's kind of where it is. We can see a good gap underneath the bottom of this MacBook Pro picture. Now, if we bring the top bar down, it moves everything down and we are now cutting off the bottom of this MacBook Pro picture, right? We go full screen in order to gain more space, in order to see more. Why not allow that all the time by putting the top bar up around the camera? Because there's pretty much never anything right in the middle of the top bar, which is where the camera is going to sit. But we are gaining a good long strip of extra space at the top. Let's do a side-by-side -side comparison using the video from the event, right? So this is before and after with the notch, without the notch. My point is, don't immediately hate it just because you feel like you have to hate notches. I do find it interesting, however, that 
This example that they have on the website for Final Cut Pro, I find it interesting that they haven't taken the screen to the full size. They've just positioned the whole window underneath the notch. If we look at this top gray bar, that could easily be pushed up around the notch because there's nothing in the middle. There's nothing directly below the notch. So if you move that up, that will give you a little bit more editing space in the actual program down below. So I just find it interesting that Apple hasn't done that in its own programs. And I wonder if they will do that in the future. They just haven't gotten around to it yet. Like if you're gonna do the notch, why not make the most of it? What I am kind of surprised about though, is just how big the notch is. And I have a couple of theories behind this. When I first heard the rumors, I assumed that the size of the notch would be about the size of the iPhone notch. I mean, the camera in that, it does the job and it's quite small, but it also includes Face ID. Yet this notch is significantly bigger, but it doesn't have Face ID and it doesn't have center stage. Now, I don't know about the technicalities of fitting in the ultra wide center stage camera. Like maybe you need more depth for that. I have no idea, but it seems weird that they've done this really large notch for just this single camera in the middle. Like you could have just done a hole punch or just a little scoop out like Samsung's done with a lot of their phones, but instead they've done a whole blocky looking notch. And I mean, it could be a few things. It could just be Apple trying to create an instantly recognizable design. It could be that they're saving center stage and face ID for future MacBook Pro releases because this is already such a big jump. They need to save something cool for future releases in order to tempt people to upgrade. And they don't wanna do a smaller notch now just to have to increase it in the future when they add these things in. Or they could be saving a smaller notch for future releases so they can be like, hey, in this year's release, we've reduced the size of the notch. We should have done it in the first place, but buy it again now that it's smaller. So to summarize, I don't think the notch is a bad idea. I think it's a great idea to reclaim that space on either side of the camera. I just don't understand why it has to be quite that big. Moving on to the next topic, the ports. I was so happy to get these ports back. I think it just makes so much sense. But then when I stopped to think about it, like personally, I actually don't really need any additional ports that much because I record all my videos on my iPhone 12 and then just airdrop it straight to my Mac for editing. Like I don't actually use an SD card slot or anything most of the time. But that being said, there definitely have been times that I have needed to use an SD card slot. So of course had to use a dongle. So doing away with the dongle, even just having to go and find the dongle, like that little bit of annoyance of having to find something to plug in to just to plug something else into it. Not having to do that on the rare occasion I think is worth it. Honestly, getting rid of the SD card slot in the first place was just so dumb. So, so dumb. And when I think about it, I still can't believe that Apple did it. But at the same time, I can. It's just such a large portion of their target consumer base would be photographers and videographers who use SD cards all the time. And the solution of, oh, just plug your camera in via USB-C is a dumb solution because firstly, you have to actually bring the cord with you to do that. And if you forget it, you're screwed instead of just sticking the SD card straight in. And secondly, if you're like on location, right? And you're shooting something, you're taking photos, you're taking videos, whatever, and you fill up your card, you can just pull it out, put in a new card, and then give that first card to somebody else to start loading those photos onto your MacBook and then keep going. I just cannot understand why they ever thought, let's push USB-Cs on photographers and videographers and people who use SD cards in general. I do understand the push toward USB-C because, you know, like USB-C is so much better than USB-A and it is the natural progression, is the technological evolution from USB-A. It's just out with the old and in with the new. Like from that aspect, it's fine. But the thing with the SD card is, it's not like there wasn't space for it. Like, the MacBook Pros were really thin, but there was space there for an SD card slot. Of course, they also brought back MagSafe, which a lot of people are super excited about. Personally, I'm not super phased by this, and I actually would have preferred if they didn't do it. I think MagSafe was a brilliant idea back in the day, and it doubtless saved hundreds of thousands of MacBooks from certain destruction. But I think USB-C is the way forward now. I was really liking being able to charge my iPad Pro, my MacBook Pro, my Nintendo Switch, 
my PS5 DualSense controller, my friend's phones, not my phone, all with the same cord. But I guess this is the best of both worlds because you can still charge with USB-C if you want to. And of course, MagSafe enables fast charging, which is a cool feature. 50% battery in 30 minutes, that is incredibly useful. Like it would really suck if you're about to go out somewhere and you thought, oh shit, I did not charge my computer. If you can charge it for half an hour and get half the battery, that's pretty cool. That's, you know, that's over 10 hours of battery life on the 16 inch model. Speaking of USB-C, luckily Apple did still leave us with three USB-C slash Thunderbolt ports, which I'm really happy about because they also put them on both sides of the computer. Because I think the great thing about USB-C slash Thunderbolt is being able to charge through any of the ports, which is what I really dislike about the M1 MacBook Pros and any of the MacBook Pros that only come with two USB-C ports and they put them both on the same side. And I was kind of a little bit nervous that Apple might be like, hey, because we're giving you back the HDMI port and the SD card slot, we're only gonna leave you with two USB-Cs and we're gonna put them both on the same side as the MagSafe charger. That would have driven me crazy. But luckily they did put two on that side, but they also put one on the other side with the HDMI and the SD card slot. Thank you, Apple. It's getting kind of dark, so I'm gonna finish filming this tomorrow. See you in a sec. It's now 14 hours later because the light was failing me. Let's talk about the price. These things are quite expensive. And I've seen quite a few comments online where people have gotten quite mad about the price. I was really hoping that they would stick to the same price points as the last generation of 13 and um, 16 inch MacBook Pros. But to be fair, I wasn't really expecting it. It was a hope, but I wasn't betting on it by any means. And I was kind of expecting they might make them even more expensive than what they did. If these chips turn out to be as good as what Apple is claiming they are, then it's probably worth that bit of a price hike. And there's a few things to remember here. Firstly, they are made for professionals. Like people are meant to use them for their businesses. Photography, videography, graphic design, video game development, rendering, whatever, like, I don't know the full terminology. I'm not these people, to be fair. In previous years, this wasn't so true. I think the whole pro thing sort of fell by the wayside, but I think this is the year that Apple is bringing it back and they're really focusing this toward professionals. And if you're not a professional, like sure, you can still buy one of these computers, but the price tag is going to be higher. And if you don't want to pay that, there is a whole range of M1 Macs, which are very, very capable, which you could purchase instead. Even putting the M1 Pro and the M1 Max chips aside, we're getting a lot of improvements here. There are a lot of changes. The SSDs are super fast. The screen is not only bigger, but it's also mini LED technology, which is more expensive. And they're taking it edge to edge, which is probably also more expensive. Not only that, but these screens are also 120 Hertz ProMotion. The camera is better, even though it's still sort of technology that's been around for an extremely long time and it probably could have been even better. The camera is acceptable now. So just before we get on to which configuration I ordered, I want to just mention that I took the advice of many people online. I watched a bunch of videos about this and I sold my 16 inch 2019 MacBook Pro. And to be honest, I thought about it for a really long time. I thought I'm gonna lose so much money on it already. This is already a very capable computer. Do I really need to sell it to update to these new ones? But in the end, I decided that I would give it a go. And if I couldn't at least sort of get around about three quarters of my money back, which I thought was ambitious, then I'm not gonna sell it. Like I'll just keep it as it is. So I ended up selling it on eBay around about three weeks ago. And to my surprise, I actually got nearly bang on 75% of what I paid for it after eBay fees. And in the meantime, I've been using this M1 MacBook Pro as my temporary device because at the moment, there's one good thing to come out of the current restrictions in Melbourne and that is that Apple has extended their returns period. So I thought I'd try this one out, see what the M1's all about. If it impressed me enough, then I would just keep it and not bother to shell out for these new ones. It did not impress me enough, long story short. So I'm so, so glad that I did that because with the money that I sold my old MacBook Pro for, it actually covers almost the entire cost of the new model that I've ordered. So in the end, and at least for the moment, I decided to go with the 16 inch MacBook Pro in silver. And that kind of surprised me because I just assumed that I would go space gray, but something about the silver this year just seems really appealing. I think it might be that with that black key well, I like the contrast between the silver and black 
a lot more than I like the contrast between the space grey and the black. I just think the silver looks really fresh and clean and I really like it. So yeah, I was feeling the silver a bit more than the space grey this year, so went with the silver. I went with the M1 Pro with the 10 core CPU, 16 core GPU and 16 core neural engine, which on the 16 inch model, that's the only way you can get the M1 Pro chip, 16 gigabytes of unified memory and one terabyte of SSD. And again, this is another area that I'm a little bit tempted to go up to the two terabytes. If I have two terabytes of space, then I will probably just use up two terabytes of space. Like I used to manage on 512 gigs and now that I have a terabyte, I'm filling that up as well. So sure, two terabytes would be more comfortable. Do I need it? Probably not. I think I can just manage the one terabyte more. So that's the configuration that I landed on, but I'm still not 100% sure about whether it was the correct decision. However, for the moment, I'm going to stick with it because if I cancel it and order a different configuration, there's a four to five week wait. And finally, real quickly before we wrap up, look at the size of the 140 watt power bricks. Like, that is a big boy. I saw a few people say, wow, that's gonna be a big power brick. And they were not wrong. Like I thought the old one was big, but this one is like, it's tall, it's definitely tall. Thankfully it is still USB-C, so it's USB-C to MagSafe 3. So I can still use my old USB-C to USB-C cable to charge the actual MacBook if I feel like charging it on the other side. So the 140 watt adapter comes standard with the 16 inch model. The base model of the 14 inch comes with a 67 watt brick and the higher up model comes with a 96 watt brick adapter. So yeah, those are my thoughts and opinions about a bunch of different topics relating to the new 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pros. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. Are you going to get one? Are you happy MagSafe is back? Do you think these things are reasonably priced? Do you think they're outrageously overpriced? Do you hate the notch? Do you love the notch? Are you totally neutral about the notch? Let me know, put it down in the comments and I'll see you next time. Bye.